Finally, I'd end by saying I do believe that one way or the other, whether it's a certain philosophy or an antipathy towards the office, uh, this is an attack on the Chief Electoral Officer. The gutting of the public education, promoting democracy, especially for disadvantaged sectors of the population, that provision of Section 18 of the current Act being replaced by a very workmanlike technical role of signaling how to vote, etc., is a serious undercutting of the function of the Chief Electoral Officer. Yesterday, I introduced the Fair Elections Act. It keeps everyday citizens in charge of democracy by pushing special interests out of the game and fraudsters out of business. The bill will make it harder to break the law, easier to vote. It closes loopholes to big money, imposes new penalties on political imposters who make rogue calls, and empowers law enforcement with sharper teeth, a longer reach, and a freer hand. The Fair Elections Act will make our laws tough, predictable, and easy to follow. Life will be harder for election lawbreakers and easier for honest citizens taking part in democracy. Law enforcement begins with the Commissioner of Canada Elections. The Fair Elections Act will give him sharper teeth, a longer reach, and a freer hand. Sharper teeth means allowing the Commissioner to seek tough, pe tougher penalties for existing offences. Longer reach means empowering him with more than a dozen new offences to combat big money, rogue calls, and fraudulent voting. It will let him get to the truth by making it a fence for anyone to deceive or obstruct his investigations. Finally, a freer hand means the Commissioner will have full independence with control of his own staff, his own investigations, and a fixed term of seven years, which means he cannot be fired without cause. Consistent with separating the administration from enforcement, the Fair Elections Act will house the Commissioner with the Director of Public Prosecutions. He will maintain his powers and functions, but gain status as a deputy head, allowing him to, to, to make his own staffing decisions and direct his own investigations. Although the two will be housed in the same office, the Director will have no role in the Commissioner's investigations. To ensure impartiality of the position, those individuals who have previously been a candidate, an employee of a political party, a minister, Elections Canada, or an MP's office would not be eligible to serve as commissioner. The referee should not be wearing a team jersey. The Fair Elections Act proposes that the current commissioner, Yves Cote, and his staff will remain in their roles, and all existing investigations will continue uninterrupted. One of the responsibilities of the, this uh, newly empowered watchdog is to prevent imposters from making rogue calls the Fair Elections Act will do this by providing a mandatory public registry for mass calling. It will impose prison time for imp impersonating elections officials. And it will increase penalties for deceiving people out of their votes. But it, is just, but it is just as bad to vote illegally as it is to deny someone else's vote. Each fraudulent vote cancels out an honest one. To avoid this, we, can, we currently have identification requirements under the Canada Elections Act. Voters can choose from one, one of 39 acceptable forms of ID. When they fail to bring any of those, someone can vouch for their identity. Elections Canada commissioned a study last year that found irregularities in one of four cases where vouching was used. Having irregularities 25 percent of the time constitutes an un, un, un acceptable risk. I want to spend some special time on this particular issue, Mr. Speaker, because that, these are the findings of the Newfeld Commission report, Newfeld report, which was commissioned by Elections Canada. According to that report, as I said earlier, there is a 25 percent error rate wow. in the use of vouching. That means every four times Elections Canada used vouching, there was an irregularity once. And I will quote directly from the report. The audit showed that the errors are made in the majority of cases that require the use of non-regular practices. Uh, end quote. Vouching is a non-regular practice. It went on to say, inadequate or ineffective training carries significant negative implications for procedural compliance on page 21. Furthermore, if I can quote uh, directly from the report's page 26, 
public trust is at risk if the rate of error is not significantly reduced by the next election. And finally, without amendment to the Canada Elections Act, procedural compliance cannot be significantly improved for the 42nd general election." End quote. If I can quote one more time, identity vouching procedure procedures are unquestionably the most complex, exceptional process administered at polling stations. The level of irregularities for vouching averaged 25 percent. It goes on. The audit, um, in an audit uh, a review, it was entitled the a Review of the Compliance of Election Day Re Registration and Voting Processes, uh, in this audit showed that, that errors are made in the majority of cases that require non-regular processes. And then it takes a global view of Canada and the practices that happen in the 308 ridings. It says the following, average across the 308 ridings, elections officers made over 500 serious administrative errors per electoral district on election day. That is 500 serious administrative errors per riding. R multiply that by the 308 ridings across the country. Obviously, this is this is, and I'm going to quote from the report again. Obviously, this is unacceptable. Aside from legal concerns, public trust in, in proper administration of electoral process is a serious is at serious risk if these error rates are not addressed. And address them we will, Mr. Speaker. The Fair Elections Act will put an end to the use of vouching on Election Day. Similarly, Elections Canada recently experimented with the use of the voter identification cards as a form of ID. Before these pilot projects, Canadians voted for years without using cards to identify themselves, and for good reason. A report by Elections Canada recently showed that roughly one in six eligible voters do not have a correct address on the National Registrar of Electors, which is used to produce the voter information card. In other words, one, in six, one out of six electors may get a card with the wrong address. That allows some to vote in a different riding than they live in, or potentially vote more than once. In fact, the uh, Quebec comedy show Infoman uh, did uh, an interesting expose on this. Two Montrealers received two voter information cards each, and so they both went and voted twice each. They called it the, quote, two-for-one special from Elections Canada. Wow. This level of error, one in six, is also too high. And as a result, the Fair Elections Act will end the use of the voter information card as an acceptable form of identification. Good plan. Mr. Speaker, to protect against fraud and to uphold the integrity of our electoral system, the Fair, information, uh, the Fair Elections Act will not only instill these new uh, rules, but it will also require in law that Elections Canada inform Canadians through the advertising function of the required forms of identification. In other words, right embedded in the law will be a provision by which Elections Canada will be obliged to inform elections to inform electors of the following: how an elector can be have their name added to the list of electors and may make corrections to the information respecting the elector on the list, how an elector may vote under section 127 and the times, dates and locations for voting, and d how an elector may establish their identity and residence in order to vote, including pieces of identifications that they may use to that end. Those are, that is the basic information that Elections Canada should advertise so that when people get to the vote, voting booth, they already know what identification they will be required to present. The good news is there will continue to be roughly 39 different pieces of identification that will be acceptable. 39 presents Canadians with plenty of options, as long as edu Elections Canada educates them of those options. It's just as important, though, for political parties to follow the rules as it is for voters. 
With a 370-page Canada Elections Act, much of the challenge is determining what those rules are. All parties fail at that from time to time, often while trying their best to comply. Since the last election, the Commissioner has had to sign 15 different compliance agreements with those who have breached elections law. Some are due to honest mistakes. Members of all parties have complained that the rules are unclear and complicated. Complicated rules bring unintentional breaches and intimidate honest, law-abiding people from participating in democracy. The Fair Elections Act will make the rules clear, predictable, and easy to follow. Parties will have the right to an advanced ruling and interpretations from Elections Canada within 45 days of a request, a service that the Canada Revenue Agency already provides. Elections Canada will also keep a registry of interpretations and consult and notify parties before changing them. Yet even with clear rules, members of Parliament and the Chief Electoral Officer will sometimes disagree on an MP's election expense return. When that happens, the Canada Elections Act provides that an MB MP can no longer sit in the House of Commons until the expense return has been changed to the CEO's satisfaction. Now remember, the removal of a member of Parliament from the House of Commons overturns the democratic decision of tens of thousands of electors. Canadian citizens. No one person should have the power to do that without providing due process. To that end, the Fair Elections Act will allow an MP to present the disputed case in the courts and have to have judges rule on it quickly before the CEO seeks the MP's suspension. Expedited hearings and strict timelines will ensure these cases do not drag on. Free speech is the lifeblood of democracy. The government, is, uh, the government is following through on its commitment, therefore, to repeal the ban on the premature transmission of election results. According to the Supreme Court, this ban is an infringement on freedom of expression. It is also completely impractical to suggest that merely banning broadcasting of results from eastern Canadian constituencies to the west will prevent that information from traveling westward. Of course, we live in a modern era where everyday Canadians have the ability to transmit information via social media and other means, so this provision is unenforceable even if it weren't a violation of our basic pr principle of free speech. Voting is to democracy what free speech is to liberty. Unfortunately, Canadians are doing less voting these days. Since Elections Canada began promotional voter participation campaigns, turnout has plummeted from 75% in 1988 to 61% in 2001. A Library of Parliament analysis shows that between 1984 and 2000, right in the middle of which Elections Canada began mounting its promotional campaigns, voter turnout among youth plummeted by 20 percentage points. Somehow, this is not working. Now, why is it happening? The truth is there are many reasons, but some of them are actually very practical. Elections Canada's own report in the, on the last election said, and I quote, in 2011, 60% of non-voters cited everyday issues as the reason for not voting. These included being too busy, lacking basic information. The same report showed, quote, the most important barrier to youth voting was the lack of knowledge about the electoral process, including not knowing about the different ways to vote. The National Youth Survey revealed that nearly half of all Canadians aged 18 to 34 were unaware of the three options for voting other than on Election Day. That means that roughly half of our youth in this country do not know that they can vote at advance polls, by mail, or through special ballot. So if you're a student and you happen to be busy on Election Day, studying or working, you do not have the knowledge right now that you can vote in other ways. That level of, infer that level of uh, awareness is inc inc incredibly low, and it's much lower amongst Aboriginal youth, whose turnout we need to see increased. Therefore, we are proposing an increase in the, the information that voters receive about the options available for them to cast their ballot. There is more evidence, though, to support the view that that is the kind of information they need. The survey uh, that I just cited indicated that roughly a quarter of young non-voters expressed that not knowing where, when, or how to vote played a role in their decision not to cast the ballot. That's why Elections Canada correctly listed its top priority on youth turnout to be, quote, increasing the awareness about when, where, and how to vote by providing information in formats suitable to youth. 
The job of informing voters is even more important for the disabled. Consultation and data show that Elections Canada does a pretty good job of providing the tools special needs voters require, such as wheelchair ramps, sign language, and braille services. Where the agency falls short is making these tools known to those who need them. To address all of these problems, the Fair Elections Act will bring better customer service to voters with an extra advanced voting day and more elections officials to relieve congestion at voting stations. But the bill goes further than that. It will amend Section 18 of the Canada Elections Act to focus all of Can Elections Canada's promotional campaigns on two purposes, informing people of the basics of voting, where, when, and what ID to bring, and informing disabled people of the extra tools available to help them vote. It will be left to aspiring candidates and parties to give people something for which to vote and to reach Canadians where they are in their communities. I look to the example set by our former immigration minister, now employment minister, who went out to new Canadians who perhaps were not entirely familiar with our democratic process because they came from countries that did not share those processes. And he exposed them to democracy and interested and inspired them in the process. Here, here. We see similar activities that occurred by President Obama, who inspired a whole generation of uh, traditionally uh, demographics that didn't vote to come out and cast ballot. Here, here. All of this shows that political candidates and aspire, who are aspiring for office are far better at inspiring voters to get out and cast their ballot than our government bureaucracies. And that is exactly how we will change the law. But that costs money. We believe we live in the second biggest country in the world, with 10 million square kilometers. We're, we're a nation that is twice the size of the entire European Union, and 95% of the countries in the world have a greater population density than we do. That means we have to travel long distances to reach our fellow Canadians. To do that, Canadian political parties and candidates spend $120 million in the last election in total. Sounds like a lot until you consider that we spent $2.5 billion on cosmetics and fragrances in one year. Our nation spends 20 times more on products like cologne and makeup every year than we spend contesting democratic elections once every four years. Now, it's fair to say that special interest groups can use big money to drown out the voices of everyday Canadians, but that's why our nation's laws try to block that money. During campaigns, parties should, run, should rely on the money of small donors not powerful special interest groups. Donors, donations, like power, should be dispersed among the many rather than concentrated with the few. As a result, the Fair Elections Act will ban politicians from using unpaid loans to evade donation limits and maintain the absolute interdiction on corporate and union money. And it will also allow a modest increase in the spending and donation limits while imposing tougher audits and penalties for those who, who exceed those limits. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, the goal of the Elections Act is to allow small donors to contribute more to democracy through the front door and block illegal big money from sneaking in the back door. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this moment to thank the now Minister of Canadian Multiculturalism who played a seminal role in crafting the proposals that I bring before this House today. He and his staff did tremendous work in, and, and have served their country well, and I am very proud, and in fact, I am very privileged to have inherited that work. I'd like to thank you now for that. Mr. Speaker, we have before us a Fair Elections Act that will further protect the basic principles that guide our democracy, that power should be dispersed in the hands of many rather than concentrated in the hands of the few that Canadians should be in charge of their democracy, that special interest groups should be on the sidelines, and rule breakers should be out of the game altogether. This is yet another occasion for us to celebrate the democracy that has brought us to where we are as a country today, to make it better, to, 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 to further instill its, uh, it in the foundation of our country, and to move forward into the future of Canadian democracy. Thank you. I would, I would note that, in some serious respect, uh, the odyssey of this bill began in March 2012 with a motion in this House that was unanimously adopted by all the parties. It was uh, sponsored by the former uh, critic for democratic reform.
the uh, member from uh, Hamilton. Uh, and it was supposed to have produced a bill on the subject matter of the motion, which was heavily focused on uh, better enforcement measures for uh, Elections Canada and measures to combat the kinds of fraud that had become uh, known through the media as having occurred in 2011. And that bill was supposed to have been tabled September 2012. Well, we know we're about uh, 16, 17 months from there. There have been serious delays. and. In, in the course of that, I will acknowledge expansions in the scope of the bill, which unfortunately have let this bill stray well away from what needed to be its core focus, and I also fear has allowed uh, the injection of an agenda that uh, is very problematic that I will talk about. I'll also say that the Minister um, does uh, like to say that he's talked to this person and that person, but uh, I think we could have a debate, but I'm not sure how any of the conversations he's had amounts to the kind of consultation that is needed on such a fundamental change to such a fundamental law in our country. The tradition used to be that all parties would be heavily involved at the drafting uh, stage so that when it hit the House, there would not be any kind of serious problem on key provisions. And at the very least, the uh, Chief Electoral Officer would be intimately involved. And we all know that that hasn't been the approach. Um, now, this is one reason why I just moved and asked for unanimous consent to take this bill to first, uh, after first reading to a committee, which in our system would allow a little bit more freedom, a lot more freedom, in fact, for Parliament to look at all the elements uh, and not be stuck with the principle of the bill as it's come forward without consultation. But as we all know, that vote uh, just went uh, against the motion. Um, the way that the bill has been rolled out uh, does have, and I say this with some regret because I do respect uh, the acumen of this minister uh, and the time he's put in since he became minister, uh, unfortunately it smacks of a my way or the highway approach to what's in the bill. There are good things, but I won't be spending my time on the good things. You'll hear more about them from different, from different members. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that there are things in here that uh, nobody's going to have any problem with that do tighten uh, systems and that do respond to some of the what I call basic reform requests that have come since 2010 from the Chief Electoral Officer around the functioning of the system. But some good points pales in comparison to what I would actually call some very awful points. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, after spending most of a good part of the last 24 hours reviewing and consulting on this bill after it was only tabled yesterday, I've come to the conclusion that it is so flawed on these key half dozen points that I will be voting against the bill at second reading. Now that the opportunity for so an earlier committee process has been rejected. Allow me to first state generally why this bill is, in my view, so deeply problematic before then elaborating a little bit further on four or five of the problems. And I'd emphasize if those problems disappeared at third reading, the vote would look different. The problem is they're there and they're, they are so serious that I, I cannot recommend to my colleagues that we vote for it. The, uh, yes, very good point. I think the, um, the former Chief Electoral Officer uh, is unfortunately an extraordinarily easy grader. When, when, all of, uh, when all of Canada knows that the imperative, the imperative behind uh, this bill eventually appearing and a central challenge is to rein in the kinds of election fraud that was discovered in 2011, the fraudulent election calls, other kinds of fraud that we know occurred um, uh, in, uh, in 2006 with what we call the in and out affair. Uh, and instead what we have is the Conservatives through this minister uh, has launched a kind of Alice in Wonderland detour by turning this exercise into some kind of an indirect and sometimes rather pointed, I have to say, flogging of the institution that's been trying to rein in electoral fraud against considerable Conservative Party resistance and manipulation. That is, Elections Canada, the Chief Electoral Officer, with his associate, the Commissioner for Elections Canada, 
This whole exercise started with the unanimous vote, as I said, in March 2012. And now, that trajectory has either been submerged or to some extent hijacked in order for the Conservative Party, through this government, to start to portray itself as victims of some kind of a nonpartisan agency. The metaphor of not wearing a team jersey was carefully chosen and it's been repeated by this minister. We all know what is intended by that. We all know the tarnishing that was intended by that of the institution of Elections Canada, in particular the Chief Electoral Officer. Um, Marc Mayron and Elections Canada are being portrayed as non-neutral players on some team versus being the neutral referees that we all know they are. And this inversion then drives the logic behind so much that is in this bill. The so-called logic is what I would like to emphasize. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, there is a second rather topsy-turvy move in this bill. After years of examples of fraud and constant brushes with the law, uh, between the law and the Conservative Party, when I say between the law and the Conservative Party, I mean between Elections Canada as the embodiment of uh, seeking to enforce the law, what we get from this minister and the government is a focus on ordinary Canadians in this act as somehow the main concern when it comes to fraud. The government has removed two means of being identified for voting. The voter's ID card, which can be pre presented along with another piece of identity, which has been developed uh, on a kind of a rolling pilot project basis by Elections Canada to enfranchise more Canadian voters. And the practice of vouching, for which there were 100,000 Canadians in the last election. And they want to effectively lure or to some extent, it seems to me, sucker the press and Canadians into thinking this is somehow about fairness and preventing fraud. Mr. Speaker, this has to be called for what it is. It is voter suppression. These are tactics that have been building over the past decade, since around 2006, since changes to the law made it harder and harder to prove you have a right to vote in this country. Colleagues of mine will provide overviews of this trajectory and also real-world impacts, examples of real-world impacts on who will be disproportionately excluded by these changes. Now, voter suppression is the result. I'm being very careful saying it's the result, Mr. Speaker, but I personally will need to be assured that this is not also, frankly, the intention. Indeed, one that is informed by the deliberate strategies patented south of the border by the Republican Party. What is more, Mr. Speaker, a third feature of this upside-down world is how this government engages in a kind of night equals day, war equals peace doublespeak by claiming that it gets big money out of elections with this bill, when there are, frankly, cumulatively, a number of measures that keep big money in play and in ways that are most likely to benefit one party most and I will leave it for everybody's imagination to know which party I'm referring to. Fourthly, Orwell would be smiling now, maybe smiling with a grimace, but he would be smiling now if he were listening to the minister talking about adding enforcement teeth to the Canada Elections Act when the single most important measure that's been requested by both the commissioner and the chief electoral officer, that is the power to compel testi testimony in the face of delay and recalcitrant witnesses was omitted. Let me turn now, Mr. Speaker, if I could ask how much time I have left. Halfway through is time. Thank you. A little more than 10 minutes remaining. I have surprised myself. Thank you. Yes, time. Normally it would be 10 minutes. Uh, let me now turn to a little more detail on these very general points. All the while I'm noting, and I think this is very important, that my colleagues in the days and weeks to come will deepen and elaborate on every one of these points. Uh, my co uh, the caucus is extraordinarily engaged with the problems of this bill, and there's a lot of expertise that will be brought to bear that I do hope the minister will listen to and that will inform uh, the committee stage. First of all, on my concern and my claim that the result is voter suppression, uh, we have to know and put this in context of an active effort by Elections Canada uh, 
that in the last election show uh, use voter identification cards uh, in a number of different contexts to try to increase enfranchisement of uh, people in our society who, as the Minister rightfully pointed out, tend not to vote in greater numbers than others. Aboriginal voters on reserves, youth on campuses, seniors in residences. The voter identification cards that are now being abolished as a method along with another piece of ID were used very successfully in this experiment with an extraordinary amount of positive feedback. Um, I'd like to uh, also, uh, I'd like to then move on to the, the vouching issue. This is something that I know, uh, I think the Minister wants to tap into some intuitive problem Canadians might have that one person can vouch for another. But we live in a society that without uh, certain bonds of trust and uh, a degree of, of uh, uh, procedural uh, stricture, that this society wouldn't function. What happens with vouching, 100,000 people were voted for in the last election, is that people who know somebody uh, who are also already confirmed as a legitimate voter at the poll in question may vote, vote for one person. And if that vouching is believed by the election day worker, then that person may indeed vote. So here's an example. Two parents show up with two uh, teenagers who were age 16, 17 at one point. Uh, bef uh, when the last election came, they sort of been missed by uh, the enumeration, which is a process which almost doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they show up at the poll. They don't have uh, the, the right kinds of ID. And or uh, they may well uh, have them but not have brought them. I'll acknowledge that in this example. One parent can vote for, vote for each and the two teenagers who've turned age 18 at this point in the story can vote. It happens a lot with uh, uh, seniors, persons with disability, and other groups. Um, just to take it back, the, the minister wants us to understand that somehow or other, vouching and some of the evidence that came out of the Etobicoke Centre case suggests that irregularities are kissing cousins to some kind of massive fraud or serious danger of it. And there, there is just no evidence. Even the 25% figure of irregularities doesn't come close to proving that the people who weren't sworn in properly or the vouching wasn't done properly didn't have the right to vote. The Supreme Court of Canada emphasized exactly that. And so it's going to be very important at the committee stage for us to hear from expert witnesses. And indeed, I'd love to see any reports or other information I don't know about tabled by this minister about what evidence, real evidence he had, does he have that there's a problem here. And here's an example of why I think there likely is not a problem. Before we went to the, new, the newest system requiring more ID than ever before in 2006, there was a controversy in one riding in, this, in the country where one party claimed that the fact that 11,000 uh, people had registered to vote on the day, on election day, and Trinity Spadina was the, it was, was the riding, somehow meant that something was amiss and that there had to have been all kinds of problems and that surely a bunch of those people could not have been valid voters. Elections Canada took that concern seriously. They hired a whole team in order to track every one of the people who had registered on E-Day through a couple of different methods at the time. And they found, by knocking on doors, all but two. And they found no evidence that anyone had voted who wasn't actually entitled to vote. So if that was the case before we got into this system, I'm not exactly sure why we should have any serious concern that this, the methods being uh, taken away now, the voter identification card with another piece of ID and vouching, are somehow tied to the risk of fraud, let alone fraud itself. And this is why I do want the minister to, to understand that in the result, this is voter suppression. And it needs to be looked at in that light in terms of who will be affected by this. My colleagues will go into more detail. Big money. Well, I'm not exactly sure that big money uh, is going to be taken out of this. The biggest problem we have in the bill, and there are three or four other points on the big money point, is that there is a new head-scratching provision that basically says, as the Minister said in the House, any money you spend through communications, most email, mail, or uh, electronic communications, or phone calls to raise money to existing donors who have given as little as 20 bucks in the last five years, 
is not an expense during the election period. Well, you know what? Any party that has an extensive database uh, system, has the capacity to phone ad infinitum, that has a huge donor base, is going to benefit from that. They're also going to be able to invest the money up front in order to pay for that excludable expense. It also adds de facto to the overall spending limit that already is going to go up 5% and thereby also benefit any party that's raising a lot of money. But you know what? And here I have great concern. This could turn into an end run around the expenses involved in voter, um, uh, the, the whole pulling the vote exercise. All that might have to happen on the current wording of this provision is that a phone call is made saying we hope you're still interested in voting for us. We understand that you've indicated that. Da, da, da. Do you know? Do you have any questions? Oh, by the way, we know you're a donor. Could you possibly also donate 50 more bucks during this thing? That whole exercise then gets shoved into another expense universe and doesn't get counted as an election expense. The potential for abuse of this provision is huge. Also, $5,000 donations by candidates are now permitted. How is that getting big money out? $1,200 limit on donations has now been increased to $1,500. That may seem small to many of the people in this house. The average Canadians, $1,200 is already a lot. Adding $300 is a huge amount. Who can afford to do that? And who can afford to do that when there is no consequential amendment increasing the tax credit? The tax credit stays at the level it was before. So that extra 300 bucks is only for people who say that extra 300 bucks is something I can afford without worrying about any portion of that as a tax credit. Um, and I won't get into the problems in bringing forward the old Political Financing uh, Act uh, bill that uh, creates an impediment on getting loans to start up a campaign for somebody who does not have even $5,000 of their own. They have to go out and get uh, $1,200 or $1,500 guarantees from other people to uh, back any loan that they now can only get from a bank. Now, I know conscientious effort was made by the former minister and I'm assuming by the current minister to try to make the political loan systems as fair as possible, but this also will potentially have a serious detrimental effect on any candidates that do need to borrow versus those candidates who don't need to because of fundraising and or because of a party that transfers money to them. No new powers to compel testimony. This is a huge issue. The Competition Act provides a clear example, and that's all that's being asked for by the Commissioner of Elections Canada and by the Chief Electoral Officer, of the ability to compel testimony in this regulatory context with all kinds of safeguards that also include you can't be charged for whatever your testimony is. Um, this has been ignored. I, I'm failing to understand exactly why. When we have a working example with the Competition Act, you know, what's good for clean competition should be good for clean elections, uh, Mr. Speaker. So it, it's really befuddling to me that the single most important change that would allow better investigation of what happened with the a fraudulent election call a scandal in 2011, the single most important change that would allow that to be investigated better against all kinds of obstruction that's occurred on, the, on behalf of the Conservative Party and indeed even its lawyers would be this amendment this reform. And if it were, it would apply retroactively because it would be procedural provision that had nothing to do with any new crimes. There are already enough crimes in the Elections Act and in the Criminal Code to cover this. You don't need a new crime of impersonation or obstruction to cover, as my uh, leader said in the House today, under the existing Act. Enhancing procedural powers could reach back in time and reinvigorate the, uh, the uh, investigations that are looking to be stalled by Elections Canada into that effort. Finally, I'd end by saying I do believe that one way or the other, whether it's a certain philosophy or an antipathy towards the office, uh, this is an attack on the Chief Electoral Officer. The gutting of the public education, promoting democracy, especially for disadvantaged sectors of the population, that provision of Section 18 of the current Act being replaced by a very workmanlike technical role of signaling how to vote, etc., is a serious undercutting of the function of the Chief Electoral Officer. I'll leave it at that, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your indulgence.
there are some very interesting facts that have been out there, and it's been a very good debate. And uh, certainly we've uh, talked a fair amount about how we want to fix the problems that we have seen, certainly in the, in the news headlines over the past uh, three or four years, and how do we address each and every one of these issues. So I want to thank uh, all members for that, including the Minister of Democratic Reform, his new position. Um, I want to start uh, with some of the summary of what, what's going, what this bill proposes. It's quite extensive uh, in many respects. Uh, protects voters from road calls and impersonation, mandatory public registry for mass calling, uh, prison time for impersonating election officials, and increased penalties for deceiving people out of their votes. Uh, gives law enforcement, as, as they point out, uh, tools, sharper teeth as they describe it, meaning allowing the commissioner to seek tougher penalties for existing offenses. Uh, we're looking at uh, commissioner, uh, they say will have full independence with control of his or her staff and investigation and a fixed term of seven years so that he or she cannot be fired without cause. Also cracking down on voter fraud by prohibiting the use of vouching and voter information cards as replacements for acceptable ID. Uh, studies commissioned by Elections Canada uh, demonstrate mass irregularities. In the use of vouching and high rates of inaccuracy on voter information cards, voters will, um, according to legislation, of the 39 forms, I spoke to, uh, as a question earlier, talked about how some of the identification uh, does not have the right information on it, such as the addresses that are required. Um, this is a problem in some rural areas, um, as we have experienced, it, many seniors especially do not have the right amount of information. I'm hoping that the government would be acceptable to a type of amendment that allows the practice of some sort of vouching in an official manner to take place. But uh, we'll discuss, uh, I guess we'll have to study uh, that in committee if indeed this bill manages to get to that, that, that level. Make rules easy to follow for all, which is uh, pointed out earlier in section 18. As commissioner has signed 15 different compliance agreements with those who have uh, breached election law. Some are due to honest mistakes. Members of all parties have noticed that the rules can be unclear. Complicated rules bring unintentional breaches and intimidate uh, everyday people from taking part in democracy. So one of the uh, things they talk about here, uh, as my honorable colleague pointed out, certainly talking about uh, youth engagement, those with uh, disabilities and others, and of course in this particular case people um, who find themselves disenfranchised from the entire system of voting and feel that their vote is not necessary or certainly doesn't mean much in the long run. But what I would, I would say to the government here is that we do need to come up with a, a, a plan that brings out probably the best in our democracy, which is to say that we need to bring out that turnout rate, which used to be so high many years ago. I have to admit, in my own riding, uh, the voter turnout was at a dismal 44%, which was the second lowest in the country. We uh, managed to finish just ahead of uh, the Fort McMurray area. Well, a lot of that actually is the case of where we do have transient workers. So in many respects, what the minister is saying, I agree with, because what we need to do is reach out with transient workers who may not be aware of the fact that they are able to vote in other ridings. Uh, the, the facilities are there for them to do that. Uh, a lot of people are not aware of that. The only problem is some of these people work in fields, oil fields, that sort of thing. But they can, even in their own ridings, vote at any time whatsoever. So they can go into the office there, of the uh, returning officer, and do that at any point. That to us proved to be the most effective way to communicate to people who travel a lot. Uh, certainly for those who travel not just to the oil fields and the rest of Canada, but to people who work in oil and natural gas fields around the world. We um, also increasing the level of donations from $1,200 to uh, $1,500. I'm not really sure if that really goes a long way, other than the fact that it allows some people who can afford it a little bit more room. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with the measures that were currently in place, the $1,200 and the increments that were uh, the formula that was already there. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I must say that about the personal contributions, uh, these are some positive steps in the right direction, certainly when it comes to both the election and also into, uh, into leadership. The Commissioner of uh, Canada Elections. This is the one that's been causing uh, some headaches within our party as to how are we to deal with the independency, 
that is being bandied about by the government. Now, I'd like to talk about how this, this works in the sense of the, the commissioner itself. One of the, several of the, the asks, we'll say, that the commissioner had made through the uh, through elections, Canada Elections Act, or sorry, from the Canada Elections Officer, basically they wanted to have the power by which that they could go to a judge to get people to comply with the seeking out information. Which at the time we thought that was a reasonable thing to ask given what has happened over the past little while. Certainly when it comes to uh, some of the by-elections that we've witnesses and witnessed and also the general election before that. But to increase the Commissioner of, of Canada Elections investigative tools, we, I, not certain as to whether this has really happened within this. So I don't know if the effectiveness has increased for that particular person, which is what's concerning to us. If you make that person independent, that is one thing. But if you do not give the increased ability to seek out the information they look for in order to conduct their investigation, then all you're doing really is the shuffling of the offices. Now. I'll, I'll get to that part in just a moment, but one of the recommendations, major recommendations, uh, the Commissioner did endorse the recommendations made by the CEO that the Commissioner of Canada elections be given the power to apply to a judge for an order to compel any person to provide information that is relevant to an investigation, which is what I just spoke of. Um, there was some debate today as to whether they do have the tools or not. Um, throughout the course of this debate, I hope that uh, more light will be shown on that subject and perhaps it will come up again later in this particular debate uh, for second reading. Lack of flexibility when dealing with conventions of the Canada Elections Act. The Commissioner suggested there needs to be more tools to deal with the breaches of the Canada Elections Act that are too severe to be handled through compliance agreements but not serious enough to be dealt with through prosecutions. The Commissioner pointed to recommendations contained in the CEO's report on the 40th general election and uh, what could be done. Uh, candidates, political parties who exceed their authorized expense limits should see a dollar for dollar reduction in their election expense reimbursement. Okay, uh, When candidate or political party fails to file a report by the applicable statutory date, they should forfeit up to 50% of their nomination deposit. Um, all this to say that some of this stuff, yes, has been addressed and we applaud the Minister for putting this into the Act. But let me just go back to one of the key tenets of this, which is the ability of the Commissioner to do his or her job, in this particular case, uh, his job. If you look at the chain of command here, you look at the Commissioner himself, by this route, through Elections Canada, they're answerable, ultimately, to Parliament. Now, one of the flags that, that rose for me was when I looked at you know, all the testimony and all the news stories that dealt with election irregularities and possible violations and actual violations over the past three or four years. A lot of this work was discovered by auditors. A lot of, this work was, a lot of the uh, violations were discovered by people on the ground within Elections Canada. What they were able to do is that they were able to advise the commissioner on a continual basis because they were within that sphere. So they just simply go down the way and just tell the commissioner that what is going on. The commissioner, if given the right tools, would have been able to investigate that further, and we believe, in a more effective way. By separating that person and putting them into a different office altogether in public prosecutions, that gap is just a little too wide, wide for the information sharing process that was taking place. That's what I fear. Now, I know that the government will argue that they have the ability to go to whenever they wish, but together in that one area certainly would have allowed the freer flow of information that would allow the commissioner to do a better job given they had the tool that was suggested by them about the compliance. If you look at it, when it comes to public prosecutions, they are ultimately answerable to Cabinet. So certainly we have reservations about that as well. I'm sure the Minister will address that also, um, hoping he will convince us it's not necessarily the case. But 
I, I will say that in this, but this is what's causing a great unease amongst us about the ability of the commissioner to do that investigation. If sharper teeth is required to do an effective job, I'm not sure the teeth uh, that are seeking here is not obtained within this legislation. Code of conduct for political entities was also suggested uh, some time ago after the 40th, uh, sorry, after the 41st uh, general election. Uh, extension of the application of privacy protection principles to political parties, new requirements governing telecommunications with electors. If I could just go to that for just a moment, the robocalls, uh, as we affectionately call it around here, has been a topic of discussion for quite some time and certainly have been a, a topic of derision for some time as well, given the robocalls. I, I noticed in the past little while that when the uh, Judge Mosley referred to, he said in, in his judgment, he said, quote, uh, seemingly that obvious to him that the origins of some of these uh, robocalls that are called into question, that they were of uh, nefarious activity, uh, points to the database that is used exclusively by the, by the Conservative Party, uh, known as the SIMS database, no relation. <laughs> Um, we are also uh, looking at, um, I, oh yeah, I want to go back to the robocall situation. So what he has here uh, is uh, some, of the, some of the measures that we think are going to be quite effective, we feel, and, and we applaud him for that. Um, the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission shall, on the request of the Commissioner, disclose to the Commissioner any document or information that it received under this division that the Commissioner considers necessary for the purpose of ensuring compliance with and enforcement of this Act other th than this division. Now, agreed. I mean, we are into an electronic age. <coughs> robocalls are now, as we call them, robocalls. Um, they're far, they've proliferated every aspect of society. It's not just politics, but in commerce as well, and in marketing. Uh, so therefore, the legislation needs to keep up to, uh, keep, keep up to, uh, up to standard, we think. And, and a lot of this goes, goes a certain way, so we uh, commend them for that. Um, person or group. Every person or group that enters into an agreement with a calling service provider under which voter contact calling services are provided shall keep for one year after the end of the election period a copy of the script, that's partially from A, and B, a recording of each unique message conveyed by an automatic dialing announcing device. Uh, again, this is great for the investigative tools necessary in order to cut down on this practice that is happening. And I we commend that as well, and we think that's uh, certainly overdue as far as updated legislation uh, is concerned. I also want to talk about um, contributions. I touched on it briefly earlier about the 1,200 to, uh, to 1,500, um, but also the subject to sec subsection 4.2, the following contributions uh, are committed. Contributions that do not exceed $5,000 in total by a candidate for a particular election uh, out of their own funds for their own campaign and for a leadership up to $25,000. Some of this, yes, necessary to be, to be updated. Uh, contributions made under subsection 4.2 do not have the effect of limiting the amounts that the candidate or leadership contestant, as the case may be, may contribute to under section 1 to the other candidates, or to other leadership candidates as well. So that's, that's pretty perfunctory in case. And I, I would say that updating uh, this legislation is necessary. Again, I go back to the fact I don't know why it went up to $1,500. I think the current regulations and rules that were in place uh, certainly do suffice. Now. I talked about the Commissioner, and I also talked about some of the other instances that took place over the past little while that raises alarm as to how we need to fix our system. Uh, the in and out scandal took place, the Conservative Party admitted to election overspending, submitting inflated election returns, and had to pay the maximum fine under the Elections Act. Fraudulent election robocalls that I just touched upon. We know of individuals such as um, Peter Padashway, formerly in this House, who also over-contributed. And there was a fuss as to whether uh, he, was, he was actually um, asked to leave, but then quit before all that happened. There was a huge fuss about it altogether. He seemed to be not knowing the rules of the game. Now, how do you get out there and tell society that we want to explain to you the rules of how to function in elections when you have trouble committing that, bringing that information to your own candidates. 
It's somewhat ironic. But any, nonetheless, that's, uh, as some people say, water under the bridge. Increased fines for Election Act violations. We're supportive of raising the fines for violations of the Elections Act. Um, my honourable colleague from Beauséjour brought a legislation here within this House that was uh, voted on. That was uh, Bill C-424 that did just that. So we, we agree with that as well. Um, you know, over the past uh, little while, Mr. Speaker, I see my time is coming to an end. But I, the other things that we touch upon that we're agreeing with, uh, the additional advanced polling day, certainly. Um, I live in a rural riding, as I mentioned. A lot of people commute back and forth. Uh, commute within my own riding, which is two and three hours away. Uh, the extra day is certainly, uh, certainly advantageous. And of course, the premature transmission of election results, uh, which, is also, um, which is also necessary, given the fact that you know, everybody has the internet, if I could use the colloqu colloquial expression. Now, in summary, um, there's a lot of unease about this, despite some of the facts or some of the elements of this bill that we fully support. I think that for us, the unease that is created from this, such as what's happening in Elections Canada, the Commissioner in particular, and other measures within this bill certainly are of unease to the point where accepting this bill in principle would be difficult for us to do. So I hope that over the course of the next little while, the debate will be elevated to the point where we can certainly have uh, uh, I guess in anticipation of the, if this bill does pass and it goes on to committee, accepted in principle, uh, I hope the government would be accepting of some of the amendments that we've discussed here today. But uh, until we reach that point, I thank you for your time, Mr. Speaker.